So thank you so much uh, for having me. It's a real pleasure, honor to be back here, have the opportunity to reflect actually on some of my time since I've been here. I graduated in 2005. Um, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about my own journey in becoming a community organizer. Um, a lot of people don't know what it means to be a community organizer. In fact, until President Obama became President Obama, you know, my mom didn't know what an organizer was and she had trouble explaining it. Now she can say, oh, you know, like Obama was before he, you know. And so <laughs> that's, that's my new thing. So community organizing, and that's what I want to talk about. But uh, the ideas that I want to share today, the, the big idea actually is democracy that I want to talk about. Um, I didn't make it up myself, so I can't take credit for it, as most of us know. Um, but I want to talk about using democracy as a way of framing and guiding forward, forward movement. I really agree with Teresa talking about the need for systemic thinking around what the future can look like to deal with the multiple types of injustice we see every day and that all of us in this room are interested in combating. But before we get to the big idea, I want to talk a little bit about a small idea and really about how I became an activist and how I was able to start the Boston Workers' Alliance, talk a little bit about the BWA, and then talk about this big idea of democracy. So uh, I grew up in, the Calif in California in the San Francisco East Bay. I went to public schools my whole life, and I was uh, someone who came from a community that was uh, middle class, but most of my upbringing, I grew up with uh, low-income people in poor communities. My school district was the poorest school district in Northern California. We actually went bankrupt when I was in elementary school, I remember being excited because they said the teachers might not come back the next day. Um, little did I really, I didn't really understand it, but you know, it wasn't a good thing, it turns out. Um, for, for, you know, I was someone whose parents were educated but lived a very modest lifestyle growing up, but I did have the opportunity to access resources even in a very high poverty school system and neighborhood. And with that, I was able to come to Harvard. Uh, it was an incredible opportunity. I didn't ever think that I would end up here, but somehow I did. And I was the only person in all six high schools in my whole school district who ended up coming to Cambridge for university. It was an amazing opportunity, but as I got here, I started to feel like I was in some sort of a predicament that all of a sudden to be exposed to the type of wealth and privilege and entitlement that is so deep within the Harvard University culture and to be coming from a place where so many people I knew ended up not going to college, but in fact were incarcerated, uh, even some people in my school who were killed while I was out here having fun at dorm parties, right? And so it came to me that I wanted to learn how to use my own privilege, this enormous opportunity to start dealing with some of the, the injustice, to deal with some of this guilt in some sense that I, that I carried by being able to make it out of that environment. Um, and so in my first semester, at, uh, second semester at Harvard, I started tutoring at a juvenile detention center. And that was a really incredible experience because it helped me start understanding, yes, in fact, verifying that the people who were locked up were like my friends, who were well-meaning people who didn't have opportunities, sometimes who made bad mistakes, bad decisions, but still had uh, value, still had dignity, and still had, could have hope for themselves. Um, but I also started to feel like the individual tutoring, while really meaningful for me, wasn't really dealing with the big picture. That, in fact, we are in a society in which the incarceration rate continued to climb at an unprecedented rate. That in 1970, we had about 500,000 people in prison. Now we have about 2.5 million, right? There's a much bigger force at work that I was interested in learning how to combat, but I didn't have the tools to do that. It wasn't until the very end of my freshman year when the Harvard Living Wage sit-in took place, the progressive student labor movement, which some people are familiar with, ended up occupying the president's office and demanding a living wage for all workers on the Harvard University campus. And it was an incredible show of direct action and protest, something that I wasn't familiar with, but was really interested and intrigued by. And so the following year, some friends and I decided we were going to do some activism too, and our first campaign was to get fair trade coffee in the dining halls. So, you know, everybody who drinks fair trade coffee, you can thank me and some other people for that. <laughs> um, the way we were able to do that really though was, you know, in that case it just tasted better anyway, and so we were able to sell it to Hudsey and people were down with it. It was great. Um, I was so inspired though, I'm like, well, activism is amazing, you could do anything. Um, <laughs> You know, it turns out that that was the last campaign I won until I won the Cory campaign like nine years later or something. But I'm glad that the first thing I tried was empowering and was inspiring, right? So I was so excited that I decided that I want to start working uh, around prison reform issues, around organizing and advocacy, although I didn't have the language. And I started volunteering at the American Friends Service Committee. Ooh. Excuse me. Started volunteering at the American Friends Service Committee in Cambridge, where um, they're working with families of prisoners and ex-prisoners. And in this space, one of the main lessons that I learned, which is my small idea today, 
is this notion that although we might have great intentions, being a person in a position of privilege and being a person who is elite, oftentimes our sense of reality is very dramatically warped. That, for example, I might think that I deserve to be at Harvard because I worked so hard, and I did work really hard, right? But I also had to remember that all the privileges, the individual people who went out of, the way, out of their way to build a pathway for me here didn't exist for other people, right? And so my own thinking might be that, oh, the school system is fair because, look, I worked hard and I got here. And, and, and then inversely, oh, people who go to prison, well, they must not have worked hard. They must have been bad, and so they belong there, right? This is a thinking of elitism that tends to perpetuate itself because it's really in our own interest, right? The society is set up in a way that benefits elite. Well, we're elite. Why would we want to change it? Well, I know that many of us in this room do want to change it, but the question was how to do it in a responsible and real way. And so from that standpoint, I learned at American Friends Service Committee this idea that Harvard students are taught over and over that we're leaders. And that's true. But the way to become a real and meaningful leader is to learn how to take other people's leadership. And that one single idea really flipped my world around. This idea that actually we might be smart, we might be great test takers, but we don't know anything. In fact, the people who are experiencing the conditions that we're trying to fight are the true experts. And that was the basic idea that helped carry me through my college and then allowed me to get a Stride Right Fellowship and then start this organization called the Boston Workers Alliance. So the Boston Workers Alliance became an organization of under and unemployed workers. And because I believed that people had to lead their own destiny, I created an organization where the people who are unemployed, ex-prisoners, felons in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Manapan were going to elect their own leadership. In fact, elect their board of directors, who in turn was my boss, right? The idea was that not only do you have to be cognizant about this, but you have to build structures that hold you accountable to that idea itself, and that's what I tried to do. Um, and so over the years with Boston Workers Alliance, we had the great opportunity to fight for all kinds of things, but one of the biggest fights that we had was that around CORI, the criminal record system. The criminal record system excludes hundreds of thousands of people from work in Massachusetts, and we felt like we needed to do something about it. In fact, my members said we have to do something about this. So we had protests, filed legislation, built a huge coalition of 135 organizations, um, and went down to the State House to talk to the governor and the legislature. It was an amazing experience, uh, and in 2008, we got a bill reported out that had a lot of our demands, but it had something that was regressive something that would have increased supervision and parole for people. I was excited to take this deal because I was the executive director of this organization. I'd staked my reputation on this idea. You know, and we've been working so hard. I had funders, funders breathing down my neck. Where is this change, right? I wanted to take the opportunity. But the members, they said, look, we're the ones who are going to have to face the consequences of whatever happens. Aaron, you're not the one who's dealing with the quarry. You're not the one who's going to have a parole officer breathing down your back. And so they decided to turn down that legislative offer. It was a very difficult day for me. But two years later, after maybe a dozen more protests at the State House, hundreds of people calling in, we were able to pass a comprehensive criminal reform bill in Massachusetts, making Massachusetts only one of two states to remove that question on job applications, have you been convicted of a felony, from all job applications, both private and public. We were able to reduce how long someone's record followed them around, from 20 to 25 years, down to five to 10 years, depending on the offense. And so what I learned from that experience was that people have to be in a position to make decisions for themselves. That as we, no matter what career you end up being in, right, whether it's medicine, education, finance, we should be asking ourselves, how can we leverage our opportunity and our privilege to help bring those who are voiceless, right? To not speak for other people, but to create structures and systems that allow others to stand up and fight for themselves. So no matter what you all do, I hope that you take this idea, this idea of democracy in a big picture and its implementation in daily life and carry it through in whatever work that you do. Thank you.